below. All right, let's just get right into it. And uh, I'm going to start with a prayer if you guys want to join me. So, in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord God, we know that you continually pour graces upon us. And we ask that with these next 20 minutes that you pour extra on us, Lord. Please give me the words to say. I trust in your message, Lord. Please help me to deliver it. Please help them to understand it. Mother Mary, patron of our village, be with us. Bring us closer to Jesus as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All right. So, my name's Lucas Pohl, if you didn't know. I graduated with the class of 2018, and Jordan asked me to come up here and share some thoughts with you. And when he asked me, my first thought was, no, I really don't want to. I don't want to talk in front of people. Uh, what do I know that they want to hear? I mean, most of you guys are my peers, you know? What message do I have? What can I teach you? So I spent the next couple of days thinking to myself, what kind of excuse can I come up with to where I can get out of it, but Jordan will still like me, right? And Jordan ended up texting me before I could come up with one. And he sent me a prompt for what I'm supposed to talk about. And when I read that prompt, I felt it right here, you know? I felt like I had to talk. And I'm not gonna read you the prompt, but what we're gonna talk about is satisfaction and identity. So let's start with a little backstory on me, right? Towards the end of my high school, starting college, once you get older, you start asking yourself some big time questions. You know, who am I? Oh, I almost just tripped. Whoops. All right. Who am I? Right? Why am I here? What is my purpose? You know, all these philosophical questions that are like, what do I know? So I kept thinking about it and my mind was just blank. I felt like I didn't really know myself. I felt like I didn't have much of an identity. Oh, I had one, I just didn't know what it was, right? So it was very frustrating for me. Now we're gonna pause that story and we're gonna talk about satisfaction, okay? It'll all loop together in the end, so stay with me. So can we agree that everyone wants to be happy and everyone wants to be satisfied, right? And a lot of times we ask ourselves questions, you know, what will make me happy? What will make me satisfied? And the answers we give, if we give one, are pretty generic, you know? I'll be happy when I graduate. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be satisfied when I retire, right? And these things are all safe, right? They're all expectations you have for your life. If you're called to marriage, you expect to be married. I mean, it just makes sense, right? And these are the things that we end up putting our hope for satisfaction in. And I'm gonna say that phrase, hope for satisfaction. And what that means is it's a thing that you cherish, you put in the center of your life, you run towards it. It's that goal you set. When I accomplish this, I'll be satisfied. So we put our hope for satisfaction in all these things we expect to obtain. But why do we do that? Um, you know, none of us want to be unhappy, right? We don't want to think that we'd ever be unsatisfied. So we obviously choose what's safe and what we expect to do in life because we don't want to run the risk of not accomplishing it and being unhappy, right? But God does not work with expectations, right? All these goals are things we expect to obtain, but God doesn't work with that. God defies expectations consistently. And I'll give you two examples if you don't believe me. You know, real big examples. First is the Eucharist. If someone that didn't know what it was saw the Eucharist, all right, you know? They give it a taste, maybe a smell, 
listen to it for a little bit, right? They would have to say, yep, that's got to be a piece of bread, you know, maybe a cracker or a wafer, right? Either way, just some kind of plain, bland food, right? But God says, this is not a piece of bread. This is my true presence, the life of the world, right? What you expected to be the most ordinary thing is actually the most extraordinary thing we have in the world, right? Second example. Jesus was nailed to a cross and hung up to die, right? Picture yourself there. If you saw that, it would be horrific, right? You would look at that and think, surely that has to be a sign of hatred and evil. But God, three days later, rises from the dead and says, that is not a sign of evil. That's the pinnacle of love. What you expect to be awful, what you expect to be the opposite of love, is actually the greatest sign of love the world has ever seen. Right? So God is defying your expectations again. He does it all the time, consistently and continually. So let's go back a second. We said earlier that satisfaction and expectations were kind of linked together because we place our hope for satisfaction in things we expect to obtain. We don't want to risk our happiness by putting our hope for satisfaction in something we might not get, right? But God's calling us every day and saying, please, take me. Make me your hope for satisfaction. He's saying, please, put me at the center of your life. Run towards me. Strive for me. Rely on me for your happiness and rely on me for your satisfaction. Okay, hold on. Didn't we just talk about how, like, that's really difficult, you know? I mean, what kind of expectations can you set with that? You know, there is no finish line with God. There is no threshold in which you cross and you say, all right, I've done it. I can be happy now, right? It goes against everything we just talked about and everything that's easy. But God calls us to it anyways. And if God calls us to it, we can accomplish it with him. The last two weeks, I went to Bible study, and this is a plug, you should all go. Great time, Jordan makes it fun. So uh, we're talking about Moses. And God calls out to Moses and says, hey, I need you to go free the Israelites. I mean, it's no big deal, they're just in Egypt. Don't worry about it, go do it, right? And Moses is like, what the, what the heck? How am I supposed to do that, you know? I'm just one person. That's something I can't accomplish. But God asked him to do it, and God gave him the graces, and he gave him the strength and the tools to do it. And this is no different than what God asks us to do that I'm talking about right now. It's no different than God asking us to make him the center of our life, to make him our hope for satisfaction. It's something that we don't feel like we can do, something that goes against our human nature, but God asks of it anyways, and he will give us the grace to do it. And if you can do it, then I promise you, he will defy your expectations once again, and he will make you happier than you ever thought you could be. So let's go back to my story. When we left off, I felt like I didn't really know my identity. I didn't know any of these big time questions, didn't really know myself or what I wanted in life. I ended up joining a men's group, like Jordan was talking about, a small group, a couple guys meet once a month, right? And these guys really helped me to not ask myself these questions, but bring them to God in prayer. And slowly, I started to understand myself more. Because surely the God who created us knows more about us than we do ourselves. And he would start revealing these things to me. And my men's group also helped me to start to rely on God more for my happiness, for my satisfaction. And I found myself happier than I ever have been. Previously in life, I would 
value myself based on what other people think of me. I would rely on the next jag with the boys for my happiness. But at the end of all those previous experiences, I found myself empty when it's over. It's over. I mean, what now? I have to wait for the next one. But God, when I relied on him, is the only thing that was constant, and it's the only thing that was fulfilling. So the last couple of things. First, I want to say that the people and the things that you relied on for your happiness in the past are not evil. It's not the fact, okay, so you don't, if you put God at the center of your life, you don't have to throw away everything else. You know, it's not God and nothing or the world and no God, right? But what it does mean is you should look at those things that you love and those things that you care about and you should try to find God in them. And if you can, you will enjoy those things more than you ever have. And if you can't, then maybe that's something that's taking up some place in your heart that God wants to fill all the more. The second thing is it's not easy. I'm about as hot and cold with this stuff as it gets. And you can't just, you know, take this message and think, you know what, I'm going to do it. God's going to be the center of my life. He's going to be my hope for satisfaction. And you're going to leave today and life will be great. If we revisit Moses, God had that initial call to him and he said yes, right? Well, the whole book of Exodus is about all his struggles, right? It wasn't just that he accepted what God wanted for him and trusted in him and there were no troubles anymore, right? It's the same thing here. You're not going to leave today and decide, okay, everything's great. You're going to struggle, but that's all right. And what I ask of you is please, when you're struggling, do not give up because God is not finished with you yet. And the last thing is don't try to do it alone. I had my men's group. We are so blessed to live in this community because there are so many people that share the same values that you can talk to. If you don't know who to talk to, talk to me. Talk to Bryce, talk to Chris, talk to Kevin, talk to Jordan, all right? Look around you. Everyone here would talk to you. I mean, we're all here for the same reason. We're all here to grow in Christ. So do not try to do it alone. You need each other to pick each other up. So quick recap, okay? God's calling us to do something that's really difficult. Okay, God will give us the graces. And if we go through with it and if we trust him, he will make us happier than we've ever thought we could be. And that's the bottom line. So thank you and God bless. Great job, Lucas. I mean, those words, are, those words ring true for all of us. Um, I was just talking to, well, actually, it was it was Dom a little bit ago, um, and, it, and it was it was kind of funny because he's telling me that. I feel like identity is like the, the most important thing that, that we can figure out, like that we're actually sons and daughters of God. And we kind of both chuckled because he also rec recalled, like, I feel like I've heard that at every single retreat. Um, and we do hear that very often. But the thing about hearing that so often is that we do it, we hear it because it's true. You want to put that on the, on the um, grass? We, we hear that so often because it's true and it's so important because once we know that identity, once we know who we are, Nothing can shake us. Nothing can move us. Right? When, when we begin to struggle and we begin to, we begin to fall and we realize our weaknesses, we just lean on the Lord all the more because we know he's our father who's going to help us no matter what it costs. And he's shown that in his act of love on the cross. And so our, our identity and our, our, our worth and our belonging, everything actually comes from him. Without him, we're nothing. With him, we're everything because he's with us. All right? Awesome. All right, you guys, um, I'm just a little concerned because I think the food might be sitting a little heavy. So if you guys want to just stand up for a second.
Just put your right hand over your head. All right, then put it down, your left hand over your head, put it down, both hands over your head, touch your toes, kick your knees to your butt in one swift move and jump. And then, I didn't see anyone do that one yet. Just like that, just like that, just give them a kick. All right, just move a little bit, you know. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right, good, Mike's on in the back. Good, so you guys are good, you guys are limber. I like it, I like it. All right, sit back down and um, I'm gonna find Dan and we'll, and we'll get started. Who here believes in Jesus? Do you believe that the decree of the Emperor Nero be heard loud and clear for all to hear? Anyone here who defies Roman law and says that they believe in Jesus of Nazareth will be put to death? <laughs> hear me, you Christians! You say that you believe in Jesus, who is the Son of God. Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. If you believe that, then prove it by giving evidence of your faith and coming up here and placing your head on this log and breathe your last. It's pretty intense, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's remarkable what happened in the history of our church. You have Jesus Christ who is mounted on a tree and left to die. And it looked like the revolution that he was bringing to the world had come to a halt. And the world sat and those who followed him waited and pined and they were thinking, oh my gosh, I just gave three years of my life following this man. I thought that he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And then all of a sudden he was dead. But three days later, he rises victorious from sin and death. He rises as Christ the King, victor over the sting of death. Jesus Christ could not be defeated. And then the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the apostles. And they begin to walk in the streets. And as they walk in the streets, even Peter's shadow heals the crippled man. The signs and the wonders, the healings, the miracles that took place in Jesus' life were now taking place in his followers' life. But then 30 years after the resurrection, Christianity officially became illegal in the Roman Empire. And the emperor Nero made a decree that anyone who professed the faith in Jesus Christ would be put to death. Right? You had family members betraying family members, neighbors betraying neighbors. Literally, Christians were ripped from their homes and thrown into prisons. They were stoned to death and burnt to death. They were beaten to death. They were crucified. I don't know if you know this, but in the Roman Empire, shortly after the time of Jesus, the roads leading into Rome would be lined. They would be lined with crucifixes. And the Christians would be crucified on these crosses to proclaim that anyone who announced a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and in the resurrection would be put to death. That Nero was God, that the Roman emperor was God, and no one else was. They professed, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. We profess a faith that we believe in Jesus Christ. And because of that, Nero would actually use Christians as human torches. He had a, a, a large uh, backyard, if you will, like an entertainment patio like this. And in his courtyard, he would, at, at the night, he would use Christians and he would tie them to stakes. And he would uh, mount the Christian on the stake and he would place a metal spike, or his soldiers would place a metal spike through their neck pour tar over them and set them on fire so they would burn for hours giving light to his courtyard as he had festival games the romans built a coliseum and in that coliseum young christian families would be devoured by beasts and animals mothers and children and fathers families being led to the slaughter while the romans gathered and cheered as entertainment Brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters die in order to profess the faith. Not one, not two, 
not 12, but thousands and thousands and thousands. They died to profess that they believed in one God, the Father who was the creator of heaven and earth, that they believed in Jesus Christ, that he was the Lord. They believed that Jesus came and suffered and died for our sake, for your sake, for my sake. They died to profess that Jesus Christ rose victorious from the grave. They died because they believed that the Holy Spirit was the Lord, the giver of life, not because they learned about it in a confirmation textbook, but because they actually experienced the Holy Spirit as the Lord, the giver of life. That the Holy Spirit entered them and they encountered him and they experienced that they went from being one person to a totally new life after living life in the Holy Spirit. Why on earth would anyone ever die for the faith? It's only because they were first alive in Christ Jesus. They died making a profession of the faith. You know, the Vatican has what they call the catalog of martyrs where they track how many people have been martyred over the centuries in that catalog of martyrs there are currently four, 40 million names of those who have given their lives for Jesus Christ in a profession of faith but what's most shocking about that number is of that 40 million names 27 million of them were written in that book in the last hundred years. That means that there have been more Christian martyrs in the last hundred years than there were in the first 1900 years of Christianity. Let that sink in. My friends, the world is not West Philly. There are certain areas in this world that if you profess that you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be put to death. That if you are caught owning a Bible, they will cut your hands off. If you're caught saying the name of Jesus, they will cut your mouth off. I mean, your tongue out. There are literally still prison camps, labor camps, where Christians are being thrown into these labor camps and forced into lives of misery and imprisonment and labor until the point of death. Persecution is alive and active throughout the world. There are Christian churches being blown up month after month. There are Christians who profess the name of Jesus and as a result, their heads are being placed on a chopping block. I know a friend of mine, he's a Baptist missionary and he goes to different countries to profess the faith. And he's been going to this small Muslim village for the last eight years. And as I was talking to him, he said, Dan, I think, I think this year, the three families I've been ministering to are going to become Christian. <laughs> Wait a second. You've been traveling across the world as a Baptist missionary for eight years, and you've only been ministering to three families, and they haven't even converted yet? He's like, I don't, I don't think you understand, Dan. Where they live, it's absolutely illegal to be Christian. And so simply becoming Christian, if anyone finds out, their whole family will be put to death or in prison. And so the action or the step to become a Christian is literally a life decision. Imagine being a father deciding whether or not your family was going to be baptized Christian, knowing that if it was discovered, you could watch your children die and your wife die. Bold steps. 27 million Christian martyrs in the last 100 years. And yet we're afraid to live our faith in front of our friends. Our brothers and sisters are literally losing their lives, and they're simply afraid just to go to Mass because their, their, their place of worship could be blown up or gunmen could come in and shoot them down. And yet we're afraid to tell our friends what we believe. We're afraid to say the responses of Mass with boldness and courage. We're afraid to use the name of Jesus. We are so blessed to proclaim Jesus. Blessed are we that we get to use his name. Use it, use it, use it. Be grateful for this incredible gift. 
The profession of faith that we pray at Mass was not written by people who mumbled it. It wasn't written by people who sat in comfortable, lofty cathedrals. It was written by the blood of the martyrs. Those words that we profess at Mass, that profession of faith, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. People lived and died to profess that there was but one God. And the narrow wasn't. There are still people that are living and dying to profess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, this conference is called Profess. And my question is, are you living the kind of life that is a profession of faith? And are you using your tongue to profess the faith well? There's this band of 40 martyrs around the year 332. They were from a town called Sebesk. And they found out that they were Christians, and so they were led, St. Basil tells us this story, one of our church fathers, they were led to the middle of a pond on a platform. These 40 martyrs in the middle of winter, and they were stripped of their clothes. And as they stood there, they were left all night long to freeze to death. But their torturers placed hot baths surrounding the platform they were on to tempt them. And they said, as long as you renounce your faith, you can jump into the hot bath and your life will be spared. All night long, these men suffer and freeze slowly towards their death. And of the 40 men, only one man broke rank. And he said, I can't do this. And he jumps into the hot bath and the moment his body touched the water, he died probably from shock, from going from such extreme temperatures of cold to heat, but also from renouncing the faith. There was one person who was there, one guard, who was so moved by the testimony of these 39 men who refused to break rank that he himself stripped himself of his garments and went out on the platform and died with them that day. You see, a profession of faith leads others to profess the faith. In the 1300s, there was a Dominican priest named Peter. He was one of the early followers of St. Dominic. And Peter was professing the truth that Jesus Christ was Lord. And there were people, heretics, who renounced what Peter was teaching. So they took an axe, and they literally lacerated the top of his head. And the top quarter part of his head was chopped off. And as Peter laid on the ground dying with his blood pouring out, in his blood he wrote the words, Credo, Unum, Deum. I believe in one God. Literally, as blood poured forth from his brain, he was professing the faith with his finger in his blood. His executioner, the one who chopped his head off, was so moved by this moment, he fell to his knees and became a Christian on the spot. And he too later was put to death. Your profession can change lives. Credo, unum, diem. I believe and one God. That's what we profess. We call it our profession of faith. And the question is, do you believe? Right? It's I believe. It's not my grandma believes. It's not everyone in my town believes. It's not my mom and dad believes. It's I stand here today and I say that I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and I believe everything that the church stands by. I believe in the teachings of this book and I will live for them. A profession of faith is something that's inside of you, a conviction of the will that says, I live and die for the truths that I speak. I believe. You see, it's not enough just to believe. You actually have to give a profession of faith. Did you know that? How do I know that's the case? Because St. James says, what good is it if you believe but do not have the works to prove your belief? He says, even the devil believes that God exists. 
But only Christians make a profession of faith, a profession of their belief. All the demons know who God is. They believe in his power. They believe that he is God. But Christians profess that he is God. They profess his power. They profess his mighty works and his truths of the kingdom of God. Only through the Holy Spirit does St. Paul say, can we say that Jesus is Lord? If you've been afraid to profess your faith, to say that Jesus is Lord, if you're not ready to go to college and make that profession for all to hear, if you're not willing to stand in your high school and make that profession for all to hear, if you're not willing and ready to allow the world to know what you stand for, Don't condemn yourself. Simply cry out for more of the Holy Spirit. Because it's through the Holy Spirit that I can profess that I believe that Jesus is Lord. It's through the Holy Spirit that I can defend the teachings of the church. It's through the Lord, the giver of life, that allows me to live this life in Christ Jesus. So today I want to talk about how there is power in faith and how there is power in a profession of faith. Did you know there's power in faith? There's power in faith. Actually, the Bible, you see this in the Gospels, that Jesus is robbed of his own divine power when the people lack faith. This is very interesting. It's not that Jesus loses power. God is all-powerful, right? But for some reason, when people lack faith, the power of heaven is unable to be released into the atmosphere of this world. One time I was assigned in college to read all the Gospels in one week. So I had to read the Gospel of Matthew in two days, the Gospel of Mark in two days, the Gospel of Luke in two days, the Gospel of John in two days. And reading all the Gospels in one week, do you know what I learned? There's a lot of miracles in the Gospels. (laughs) It's like everywhere Jesus goes, there's miracle, 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 miracle. And it's so interesting because as Jesus walks into towns and villages, it says in multiple accounts that everyone in the city was healed. Every disease, every illness was healed. That when people encountered Jesus, they were healed from their brokenness. Why? Because Jesus wanted the reality of heaven to be poured out here on earth to give a sign and to give evidence of the power of heaven and the beauty of heaven. But there's this one town that Jesus goes into, his hometown, And the people lacked faith because it was Jesus of Nazareth. He grew up here. And it says in the Bible that Jesus was unable to perform any miracles in that town because of their lack of faith. You see, there's power in faith and there's weakness in the lack of faith. When people have faith, it's an invitation for God to work. When you and I have faith, It's an invitation for God to work a miracle in our lives. This is what the Bible says in Mark chapter 5. I love this story. It says that there is a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. (laughs) That's a long time to be afflicted with a disease. For 12 years, and she had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yes, she was not helped, but only grew worse. Could you imagine if you, for 12 years, went to doctor after doctor after doctor and spent all the money that you had and you never got better, but you only grew worse? If anyone had a reason to doubt that she would ever be well again, it was this woman. If anyone had a reason to be frustrated and bitter and angry at God, it was probably this woman. And then it says this, she heard about Jesus. And came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately, her flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Now just, I love this phrase, she had heard about Jesus. Every one of us here has heard about Jesus. And there's a a problem with growing up as a Catholic sometimes. Sometimes we grow up about as a Catholic and we hear about Jesus so much that Jesus stops being divine and Jesus becomes kind of like a children's fairy tale. 
right? Like we hear the gospels at mass and instead of being amazed and, and filled with wonder and awe, the fact that Jesus walked this earth, God became man, like that should blow our minds. Like, are you kidding me? God became man? And God touched the blind man, and he was able to see, and he touched the, 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 the deaf man, and he could hear, and he said to the cripple, arise and walk, and he got up, and he went to the tomb and said, Lazarus, come out, and the dead guy came out of a tomb, and people witnessed it? Does the gospel amaze you, or has it become too commonplace? I think sometimes we have heard about Jesus, and because of that, we lack faith. But when she had heard about Jesus, her faith increased. Because when she heard that Jesus healed some people, she said to herself, well, if Jesus can heal them, then he could heal me. You see, what we read in the Bible and Mass is meant to be a profession of what Jesus can do in your own life. That if Jesus done it, has done it in someone else's life, Jesus wants to do it or could do it in your life. The Bible says that prophecy is a spirit i mean the testimony is a spirit of prophecy that when we hear a testimony like we've been hearing today it should stir in us a hunger that i want god to do that in me and as she touched him she was healed of her affliction it says this jesus aware at once the power had gone from him turned around to the crowd and asked who has touched my clothes the woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and took, told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. Now, I love this. So Jesus is walking and the crowd is pressing in all over him, right? And this woman who is ill, it's not like she gets Jesus' attention and says, will you heal me? No, she simply sees Jesus walking through the crowd. There's people all around him and her faith is so high. She's like, if only I touch him. And she reaches out and touches his cloak. And it says that Jesus felt power come forth from his body and enter this woman. The power of God, the power of heaven, leaves Jesus' body, enters this woman, and she's healed. It wasn't like Jesus made this sincere act where he even saw her. And then he's like, whoa, wait, I felt this power. Who's touched me? And then she says that she comes with fear and trembling, not because she was afraid that she was going to get punished, but because the power of heaven just entered her body. She's like, oh, my gosh, you are God. You, you are God, you have to be him because I touched you and I felt power enter into me and this affliction that I've had for 12 years is now gone immediately. She has fear and trembling because she's just encountered God. So what does faith do? Faith pulls on the power of heaven and releases it into the atmosphere of earth. That's why we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The faith pulls the power and the reality of heaven down to earth, and it can do it in your life. That the power of heaven can be released in your life, it can be released in your family, it can be released on your friends, it can be released in your school, it can be released in this nation. The only power we need in this nation, again, is the power of heaven. The only name we have to profess in this nation, again, is the name of Jesus. Because only he has the name above all names that every tongue will profess and every knee will bow down to. So I just want to share is that faith changes things. This is what Jesus says. He says, if you believe whatever you ask of me, I will do for you. If you have faith, whatever you ask, I will do. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do for you. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find. Everything, he says, is possible for the one who believes. Faith changes things. Faith changed my life. I shared earlier that I, my, the story about how I fell in love with Jesus. What I didn't share was I fell in love with Jesus and started hanging out with a lot of Protestants who also loved Jesus. 
And I had these awesome Protestant friends who talked about Jesus all the time and read their Bible all the time. And I started to look at all my Catholic friends in my Catholic school and at my Catholic church that didn't talk about Jesus. They believed, maybe, but they didn't make a profession of their faith. They didn't read the, this book. They didn't have active prayer lives that I could tell of. And, and so I lost faith in the Catholic church. I remember telling my mom, Mom, I can't believe you're Catholic. Everything about the church is so dull and boring. You just listen to whatever they say this old guy in Rome tells you to do. And I told her when I graduate high school, I'm going to leave the Catholic church. and I'm going to enter this church where my friends went. And my mom, she's like, <laughs> Daniel, don't do that. I'm praying for you, right? And that summer after my senior year in high school, I went to Mass. And just like Kinsey was sharing, it was a daily Mass. Someone for the first time ever in my life had shown me John chapter 6, the bread of life discourse that Kinsey had talked about where Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. I saw that John chapter 6 where they all walked away and Jesus let them walk away. And then when Peter said, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words to eternal life. And I read this as someone showed it to me that day before I went to Mass. And so in my mind, I started to think about the Eucharist, but in my heart, I didn't truly believe that it was Jesus. I was like, well, God, you're God, and you like to give evidence of who you are. So show me who you are. And as I went to Mass that day, I went to receive communion, and in my heart, I prayed, Lord Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when I received communion that day, it was like scales fell off from my eyes. I was given the gift of faith, and it wasn't like some powerful emotional experience. It was just a normal daily mass, and I didn't feel a whole big change inside of me. But when I left that day, I left a different person. I went back into school, and I was more courageous to share the faith with my friends. I was more courageous to stand for what I believed in. There was teachings of the church that I didn't believe in that now all of a sudden I had faith in and I could actually uh, defend the church's teaching. It was as if the gifts of the Holy Spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and courage had been lying dormant in my life. And when I received the Eucharist with faith, those gifts of the Holy Spirit became alive in me. And that passion that I had became more and more rigorous and filled with hope and joy. There is power and faith. And as I began to give my life to the Lord, my friends and I, we, we, we started to share the name of Jesus with as many people as possible. I got right into ministry and I started to learn how to do ministry. I started to, to be mentored by other people who were doing ministry. And I, I became a youth minister uh, at the age of 18. I started uh, having people over my mom's house and uh, we would just invite anyone who would come to my mom's living room. Within eight weeks, we had over 70 people in my mom's living room. We had to clear out all the furniture to make room for all the people. The cops thought it was some crazy drunken party happening because they saw all of these teenagers and all these parked cars walking into a house and they heard this loud noise aka worship and so they called the cops the cops show up with two paddy wagons ready to arrest us and my mom answers the door she's like oh officers we're just singing songs to jesus right and god started to bless the work of our hands because we were making a bold proclamation a profession of faith you see the neat thing is everyone wants to get behind you they're just waiting for someone to be the leader. The word I was receiving when I was praying for you is that you are waiting for someone else to take the lead. And God said, stop doing that. You take the lead. You be the initiator. People are so hungry for the leader to step forward and do what they want. Be the leader. Be the voice. Be the one that professes. And people will get behind you. I promise. Break the mold of silence and break the mold of timidity. Make the profession. Have faith. Faith changes things. And as my friends and I, as we started to cry out to God in more faith, we started to read scriptures together and we said, you know what? We want to see what's happening in the Bible. We want to see it in our own lives. And so we started to pray for people for healing, and we weren't seeing healing. So we kept going back. We said, Lord, we see this in the Bible. Teach us how to pray. 
We just kept praying and praying and hungering and hungry, not for one year, not for two years, but for years. And then God started to release more power from heaven. And it's been such an amazing journey because I've seen middle schoolers go home and pray for their parents and their parent who had cancer was healed from cancer. We've seen people with one leg shorter than the other leg. The leg literally grew out in front of us. We've seen broken bones healed. Just a few months ago, we had a girl in the middle of adoration. She, was, uh, she had a torn ACL and she was scheduled for surgery the next week. During adoration, she's sitting there and she hears Jesus speak to her, arise my daughter and jump. And she's like, well, that's weird. So she gets up and she starts to jump and all the pain in her knee was gone and her ACL was healed. She went to the doctors. Doctor said, I don't know how to explain it. It's as if the tear never happened. We've seen miracle after miracle, which is so amazing. Why? Because there's power in faith. What does Jesus say to this woman? He says, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. See, faith does three things. Number one, it saves you. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So brothers and sisters, that means if people aren't in relationship with Jesus, their eternal salvation is at risk. I don't know how any of us could be silent if we believe that phrase of Jesus. So either Jesus is a liar or we're not willing to take Jesus at his word. He says that no one comes to the Father except through me. So what that does is it places on us a missionary mandate to go out and to profess the name of Jesus because their souls are at stake. And I don't want to get to heaven someday and Jesus look to me and say, you know what? You can come in and take your reward. But the people who are in your life, look at them in hell. I want to say, I want to get to heaven and I can't wait till I get there and God to say, come in and take your reward. And look who else is here because you weren't afraid to profess your faith. He says, daughter, faith, your faith has saved you. And he says, go in peace and be cured of your affliction. That faith heals us. And I think there are some of us today who have come with an affliction. Maybe we have an affliction of the heart that the last few months have been really hard. And we're feeling loneliness or anxiety higher than ever before. Maybe there are some afflictions in your families and there's brokenness and there's pain and there's tension right now. Jesus said, I am the healer. I have come to heal your heart. I have come to heal your wounds. I've come to heal your family. The more you let Jesus in, the more he can heal. But Jesus doesn't just say you're cured of your affliction. He says, go in peace. You know, I've prayed with a lot of people for healing. I've seen some people healed. and I've also seen other people not healed. But you know what I've never seen? I've never seen a person leave a time of prayer not with peace. That when we love another person, Jesus Christ fills them with peace. And the peace of heaven falls upon us. And I believe the peace of heaven is here tonight to fall upon you, to allow you to have access to his goodness. There's power in faith. Faith gives an invitation for God to work. And there's power in a profession of faith. Did you know that in order to become a Christian, you actually have to make a profession of faith? You can't be a Christian if you don't make a profession. That's why at your baptism, your parents made a profession of faith for you. They asked your parents, do you reject sin and Satan and all of his works and all of his empty promises? And they said, I do. Do you believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. Then in order to become a Christian, we have to profess our faith. And faith, I mean, the profession of faith is so powerful because the mere profession releases grace. When I simply say in faith that I believe that Jesus Christ wants to reclaim America with love and peace again, that releases the atmosphere of heaven. It does something in this world. But if I hold back, and if we allow everyone else to profess their false doctrines and their false gospels and their false agendas, and we allow the gospel of Jesus Christ and the profession of faith to be repressed, we're allowing the evil spirits and the evil power to be released in this world, and we're not releasing God's power. 
Do you feel it right now? Do you feel in our world darkness rising? I bet you do. I think we're living in what's going to become known as a social civil war. And it's crazy because in some wars, the battle is fought in a battlefield you never see. But all of you on social media are seeing this battlefield of our society right now. This darkness in our society. And it's becoming darker and darker, more and more divided. Man against man, woman against woman. And in the midst of all this, we as Christians are afraid to profess the truth. We're afraid to profess the grace of God. We're afraid to share the name of Jesus. Christianity will be crushed in America if we don't share the gospel and pass it on. There is power in a profession of faith. God is, has a spotlight of heaven on you right now. In this moment of history, the spotlight of heaven is on you. And all of heaven is looking down at you. And they're saying, what's she going to do? What's his response going to be? And they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting for you and for your life to be revealed. They're pining and driving that you would become the saint you were created to be. That your life can allow an, a glorious applause in heaven. That when you profess the faith, when you live the faith boldly, the heavens cheer for you. The spotlight of heaven is on your life in the year 2020, asking, what are you going to do? How are you going to rewrite history, son of God, daughter of God? There's a few stories I want to tell. A profession of faith made it all the difference. When I was in college, I had a friend who had, uh, in high school, we kind of went to, to youth group together. She was in a different youth group. I didn't know her all that well, but I knew that she at least went to some church things like this that I went to. And we went to the same college, and I noticed that this girl, her name was Candace, she started getting involved in the party scene, and she was at all kinds of parties, and she started to do pretty uh, aggressive drugs and get drunk all the time, uh, which led her to fall into a lot of impure relationships with guys. And so my friend and I were like, we got to win Candace back for Jesus. So we started to ask Candace to come to church, uh, youth, like our, our, our young adult group with us. And she told us no a lot. She told us no a lot. So then we started to go to Can with Candace to her parties. And we're like, well, if you won't come with us, we'll go with you. And we just started modeling Christianity around her friends that were totally not doing it, right? And so we would, instead of playing beer pong, we would find like, like fun things like bacon bits and play bacon bit pong and like make jokes out of it, right? And Candace was inspired. She said, okay, fine, I'll come to uh, SPO. It was uh, the name of our prayer group. And she comes to a prayer meeting, and that night she has the spirit of repentance fall upon her, and she begins to weep, and she goes to confession. And she gave her life back to Jesus, and she restored her relationship. She walked away from those things. Candace is now Sister Maria Gemma. You know, it would have been easy for me to say, I'm not going to share the gospel with her. She's making her own choices, or I may be weird. I was rejected by Candace multiple times before she said yes to coming to church with me again. But that profession of faith not only saved her soul, but now she's a religious sister saving other people's souls, right? There's another girl in my college class named Brooke. I was in this college class. It was called Introduction to Christianity. I went to a Catholic uh, college, but if you don't know this, some Catholic colleges are very scandalous because the professors teach the very opposite of what the church actually teaches. And this was that class. It was actually a religious sister who was not faithful to the church teachings, and she would teach contrary. She taught that homosexuality was okay. She taught that we should explore our sexuality. She taught that abortion was okay. And in class, I was the only one who would defend the faith. And it was miserable because my classmates mocked me for it. And it, I would, it got to the point where I hated going to class because I knew I was going to have to stand up for something and people were going to beat me down. And it was a two-hour class. In the middle of the two hours, we had a 10-minute break, and I would literally go to the men's bathroom and sit in the men's bathroom and pray the chapel of thy mercy for the conversion of my classmates and for the strength to keep persevering. There were people in my class that didn't like me because of what I had said, and so they actually slashed not one but all four of my tires on my car. 
And then one day, Brooke got pregnant. And after class, she says, Dan, can I talk to you? My boyfriend wants me to have an abortion. My parents agree with him. I don't know what to do. No one in my faith, I mean, no one in my life wants to support me. I said, well, I'll support you. And I know a lot of people who will support you as well. Because I was willing to be rejected and put out the truth of the gospel in that moment of disaster in Brooke's life, she knew who she could turn to for support. And because of that, Brooke had her baby. And that baby's alive and well today. You see, a profession of faith changes the reality of this world. Your silence matters. It causes pain, and it allows the advancement of the kingdom of darkness. But your profession matters as well, because it causes life, and it allows for the kingdom to be advanced forward. So I'm going to close with this. St. John Paul II, he spoke of the early martyrs, and he said in the first millennium, the church was born out of the blood of the first martyrs. He said the second millennium, the church was sustained by the white martyrdom of the religious, like the Benedictines, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Jesuits. And coming into the third millennium, he said, who will restore and renew the church in this third millennium. In the last 20 years of this third millennium, we're seeing an insane decrease of Christianity in America. I don't know if you know this, but there's been a rapid decline of those in America who profess that they are Christian, and a rapid increase of what they call nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those who have no religious affiliation at all. And a recent Pew study was done. And it said that the millennial generation is the first generation in America where there are more young adults now that profess that they have no faith affiliation than there are those who profess that they are Christian. What does that mean? It means America, since its founding, was a Christian nation. And for the first generation ever in America, we have now lost Christianity. There's power in a profession of faith, and I want to make a profession of faith that someone spoke over me, and I want to speak over you. They shared with me that God wants to reclaim the youth of the church in America, that he wants to reclaim American youth for Jesus. And I want to make this profession that Jesus Christ wants to do something in your generation. Generation Z will become known as a generation that reclaims Christianity in America because I believe that you have more boldness, more courage, more ingenuity and creativity than any other generation before you. In the Bible, 360 times it says, be not afraid. Do not be afraid. I think it's there one time for each day of the year to remind us, never be afraid. Let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, I just pray for the power of heaven to fall upon these young people right now. That they would come to love you. That they would live and die for you, Lord. That they would profess the faith. That they would be fearless evangelizers of your name. I pray that the name of Jesus would be in your bellies like a fire. So, Lord, I just pray for fire to fall right now into their bellies. I pray your name would be on their tongue, that they couldn't help but say your name, Lord. Fill them with all courage and boldness, Lord, like the early church. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So much, Dan. I mean, do you, do you almost feel the like the you hear what he's saying, and you feel the desire, and there's almost a part that's like, 
that's a high that's a high calling. That's a high standard. Um, as, as I'm just praying and listening to what he said, and, and don't get me wrong, Dan, I absolutely covered this, but I want to just reiterate this to you guys as well to make sure you know. But you're not, you're not doing this alone. In fact, you're not you're not really the one doing anything. In fact, you're just leaning entirely on God to do everything that he had just talked about. And you're working and you're leaning with other people together to take these leaps of faith. Because I don't want you to be overwhelmed by what he said, because what, what Dan was just preaching about was absolutely amazing and it fires me up. And I just, I just can't imagine if we all took that to heart and we went home and our lives were never the same. And then when we walked the halls of school, if we ever walked the halls of school, or we walked the stairs of our homes, in the, way, in the rooms of our homes, and we walked with this attitude, and we walked with this boldness and this courage, that we were willing to literally die for our faith if that's what it came to. If we all lived like that, my job would be pretty easy. Because you guys would all just be like, oh, let's go, let's do it. And even more than that, our town would be drastically changed. Now, don't get me wrong, we, lived in a really, we live in a really blessed community. Blessed communities, I shouldn't exclude any of the other surrounding ones. But you guys, we have a long ways to go. Because I don't know about you, but when Dan first came up and he talked about, you know, with the axe and he talked about Emperor, Emperor Nero, and I, I honestly, like, I, I pray that I have the courage. I tell this probably to you guys, and I say it to my seventh and eighth graders all the time, but I pray, I pray, like, God, if, if you were ever going to ask of my life so that I wouldn't deny the truth, would I have the courage to do it? And I say, God, please, please give me that. I can't even imagine he has the ax, you know, and I picture him over here and I think, could I lay my head down and just wait for someone to just do whatever they had to do? I mean, and put yourself in that position. Can you do it? Well, right now, probably not, because God's not calling us to do that. But I pray that if I ever came to that point in my life, that I would have the faith to do it. And if I ever think, yeah, I probably can, then I'm going to challenge you and say, then why can't we just walk through the halls and say Jesus' name and, say, and talk about the Holy Spirit and talk about the things that God's doing in our lives? Because if we can't do those simple things, we're never going to do those big things. And those simple things are the things that build us up and lead us to these bigger and bigger things. And God keeps asking more and more of us, not because he's trying to like get the most out of us and then throw us away, because the more he gets out of us, the closer we get to him. And then the more we get to him, the more he gives us because he knows that we can do more for other people. And at the end, hopefully we hear the words of St. Paul, like the St. Paul talks about, where like, you ran the race. You did a job well done. And at that point, when we're hopefully in heaven, every single bit of struggle, every, bit, every single risk that we take, everything we do, everything, every little way we've stepped out and we've challenged each other, and we've challenged ourselves to be closer to God, all those things seem so minimal in the sense of the risk that we had, and they seem so great in the reward that's given. We are truly called to greatness in every sense of the word. Not the way the world tells us, but the way God calls us to it. The way God calls us to these things. And so as we go forward tonight, if, you, if, you, if, you, if any of you have that sense of like, this is a lot. The only reason we have that sense of feeling, and I'm there with you at times, is because we don't trust God. And God enough. We don't know God's love enough for us because if we know God's love to the full extent that he wants us to know it, there's going to be nothing that can ever stand in our way. There's going to be nothing that can ever stop us. And so if that's you, if that's you and you're, and you're saying, I, I don't know if I'm there. I don't know if I have the courage to do what he's asking us to do. Then let's make that our prayer tonight, that we let God work through us so powerfully that after, after we hear more testimony and we, and we encounter Jesus Christ and the Blessed Sacrament, that we know his love in such a powerful way that we, we can't help but we could never deny him. We could never preach his truth. That we could never even think about not standing up for the outcast. That we could never think about just letting someone go starving. That we could never think about letting our friends make fun of who Jesus is and what he says he can do. That we would never joke about something about the mass. That we wouldn't hold that in the highest reverence because we believe that Jesus is Christ body and blood are present. So if that's you, make that profession. If you already believe it, then just ask for more. Just ask God what he wants you to do, what he wants you to do, where he wants to send you, how he wants to work. Like, <laughs> the best thing we can ever do is just to put the ball in God's court and be like, God, 
I'm giving you this opportunity. Speak to me. Work through me. Use me how you want. I know I'm weak. We're all weak. We're, we're never going to have it together. And the moment you think you do, you're going to be wrong because you cannot function without God helping you. That is just who we are. And it's a beautiful thing because, believe me, if it was all on me, if it was all on you, I, I, I would be very scared. <laughs> I would be very scared for what we have ahead of us. So we're going to just really quickly, we're going to go... Um, I just, if anyone has to go to the bathroom, I know like people are like chugging water and stuff. So like if people have to go to the bathroom, whatever, take a quick break. Um, we're going to come back here very briefly. I, I don't want you to like go off and like, I don't know, take a, take a break and go to the ark or whatever. But if you got to go to the bathroom, if you need to get some more water, please do so. Um, be back here in uh, 10 minutes. So at 9, 10, all right?
Hey everyone, this If you're going somewhere yet, yeah, try to hurry because we're going to get started like in nine, eight, seven. No, I'm just kidding, but just kind of hurry.
right, you guys, we're going to get started, so if you want to make your way back to your seats. So, initially, when we first started, like, planning this and, and talking about this, um, obviously there was a lot of, like, we're super bummed that we're not going to Steubenville. Like, that's always a big event for us. That's always something that, that I get fired up about. Father gets fired up, and I know you guys get really excited about it. Uh, and so, we thought, you know, obviously you guys are going to be bummed. And obviously that's like a big reason for putting this on. Um, but we just have a couple of videos. Uh, one of them is from like one of the speakers we were actually gonna see. And this first one is, uh, is John, he's from, he'll introduce himself in the video. Uh, but he actually works with Steubenville. And the, re and the reason I wanna show you is not to just be like, hey, look, we got a video, but to let you know that people are actively like praying for you and they recognize that like, one, that the youth of our culture is what's going to change the world. Like you guys, are the ones who are going to change things and they know that and they're praying for you and they care about you and two and to just let you know that like as we go into adoration these people have been praying for you like continually not just now but like they've been keeping you in prayer so know that people are here like with you in spirit and praying for you and encouraging you and so you're not alone on these things so we're just going to play two really quick videos for you guys Stupid conferences, and I just want to say how just hold on a second. Hey everyone, this is John with the Steubenville Conferences, and I just want to say how disappointed we all are here in Steubenville that we're not going to be able to share one of our awesome conference weekends with you this summer. But I understand that you're gathering from across your diocese today to celebrate the love of Jesus and to encounter it in a new way. So I pray and invite you, open your heart as wide as you can to receive the love of Jesus. It's what you need right now more than anything. And I hope that we see each other at a Steubenville Conference next summer. May God bless you abundantly. I hope, hope you're having a blast at the Profess Conference. Hey guys, Paul George here. I hope you're having a blast at the Profess Conference. I can't tell you how bummed I am not to be with you this summer at the Steubenville Conference. How much I was looking forward to an amazing weekend. And I'm excited that you guys are making the best out of this crazy, wonky time, right, in our history and having this conference on your own. I want to let you know that I'm praying for you. I, I actually wish I was there with you. Um, I hope you guys have a blast. More importantly, I hope that you have an encounter with Jesus. And, you know, in the midst of all the turmoil and the uneasiness and the chaos and the ups and downs of life, there's one thing that's always consistent, and that's Jesus. And Jesus in the Eucharist as well, the sacrament where Jesus gives us his presence, the, the risen Christ, the true presence for us. And no matter what you go through in your life, no matter what, he'll always be present with you uh, spiritually, physically. And that's the beauty of our faith, that God doesn't abandon us or leave us or forsake us. So I'm praying for you guys. I wish you well and uh, have a blast and pray for me and my family this weekend. God bless you. All right, so super pumped. Actually, if someone wants to just exit out of that, because now we just see Paul's face. Um, but it's cool. It's cool. I mean, th these people really care about you. I know, I know sometimes we go to Steubenville on the stage, and, and even the people working, and um, we put them on a pedestal. But it's in, in, in a way, when I see this, it's like, you know, they're really they're, they're there with us. They're walking with us. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and, and they're trying to encourage us along the way. We're all, we're all in this together, and we're all trying to just – hopefully make it to heaven and become the saints that God's called us to be. And so uh, as, we, as we move through the night and after everything we've heard, now we just want to focus on why, like, why, why now? Why, why should we 
why should we profess this? Right? Lucas talked a lot about finding our identity and a source of satisfaction, uh, but it, it can seem so far away. Right? If we're fixing our if we're fixing our goals on heaven, which we should do, don't get me wrong, uh, but it can be so hard for us to really keep in mind like what it is we're seeking and why we want to seek it. Because the heaven, for a lot of us, seems so far away. We don't really know when we're going to get there, if we're going to get there at all. Hopefully all of us are there. But it's hard. But, but I tell you, that, and, and Dan talked about this, but like we're, we're called to bring heaven to earth. God, God doesn't want us to just feel happy once we finally reach heaven and to be miserable along this whole journey. Like he wants us to experience the joy and the love that he has in each and every moment of our lives. That when we're suffering, we still have joy. That when we're having fun with our friends, we're having like holy joy. Like we're experiencing God among us. We're experiencing God in the people that we're with. We're experiencing God in what we do. We're experiencing God when we fold the laundry like Sherry said. Like he's everywhere and he can make everything that we do worthwhile. He can make everything that we do seem so much better than we could ever imagine because he is God who is all-powerful. And so this next testimony we have, uh, we're going to bring up Bryce Thalen, and he's going to talk to us about how the Lord has actually met and exceeded his expectations and the ways that he's worked in his life. And we want you to know that this is what God has for you. So Bryce, if you want to step on up, I'm going to turn it over to you, and if you guys want to give him a round of applause, we'll give him the stage. awesome speakers. Hope you guys uh, have had a good day as I have, and I hope you're taking so much away because this has been a huge blessing. We've had some amazing speakers here, and uh, I guess I'm next up. So I guess what I'm going to tell you guys, I'm just going to get to my testimony and kind of tell you guys how I went from pretty much no faith to really learning how to let God take over, let God fulfill my desires because I pretty much was going down an empty path. So here we go. I guess I'll start with my story. So I was in middle school-ish, and I was pretty much, you know, going to church because mom told me to. Uh, it was about the extent of it. I'd walk in. It's like you're clocking into work. I'd walk in, do mass, you know, I'd put my fingers in the holy water, and I'm like, all right, clocked in. Hour, let's go, let's do it. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty pish posh, and it was uh, not much effort went into it by any means. And I remember when I got to freshman year of high school, and I walked up, and I just remember seeing people walking into class late all the time on Thursdays. And I was like, finally asked a couple of buddies, I'm like, why are you guys always late? Like, I don't, I just, I want to be late to class. Like, I don't want to sit in first hour. So I finally got up scourge. I said, hey, you know, what's up? Why are you guys always walking in late? And he said, oh, we're going to Bible study on Thursdays. And I'm like, Bible study? I'm like, what time you got to get up? He's like, well, we start about seven. So I remember thinking, and I'm like, oh gosh, a half hour getting up earlier, and I get to class five minutes late, not worth it. So after a couple more weeks of seeing that, I uh, just would continue to see people going down the hallway, and I'm like, man, like these guys look so happy. Like, what's going on? Why are they, I feel like, yeah, I got a smile on my face, but like, that's about it, you know? They just feel like they got something that I don't. And so... A couple guys, you know, suggested, like, hey, you should come stop by sometime. We use another guy in our group. And I was like, eh, you know, maybe I'll think about it. And after a couple weeks, a couple buddies convinced me. And I'm like, you know what, sure, why not? Let's give it a try, right? What's the worst that happens? I go a couple weeks and I leave. So I ended up showing up and happened to be that uh, some cool guys there. And my thought process was to uh, show up to class five minutes late. That's a nice plus, right? And there's also a kind of this person I had a crush on, and my little extra face time, I mean, what's not to like, you can see me for an extra hour a day, right? So I uh, started going a little more, taking it a little more serious, and you know, it wasn't necessarily the right reasons to start, but it was a start, and that's all God needed. So I guess I just was there, and I would start noticing everybody would read the same passages, and that was the goal. Everybody had about five different groups, and everybody would read, like, we'll say 12 verses. And everybody in my group would read the same thing, but yet there'd be a different message. And I'd get so confused, and I'm like, how can you read the same thing and everybody's picking something different out of it? Like, what, what does this even mean? So I uh, guess I just kind of started asking questions, like, how did you get that out of this passage? Like, I don't understand. Like, I read it, and it's like, oh, yeah, 
You know, God took bread and he said it was his body. Cool. All right. That seems pretty simple to me, right? And uh, everybody just seemed to get so deep. So I'm like, well, I, I want to be the odd man out here. So I started asking questions, which ultimately helped uh, really start the brain of churning. So I guess I started going. I started taking it a little more serious. I started to be happier, and I started noticing other people were acknowledging I was going. And although I wasn't necessarily deeply rooted, so to say, I just started to actually just be filled by people who actually cared. And I could tell they were on fire, and it was something I wanted. So sophomore year comes around, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good. I, you know, go to adoration once in a while. I go to mass, you know, once every once in a while during the week. Like, oh, that's pretty good, right? Doing more than what I did a year ago. So I uh, started going, and uh, I got hit really hard my sophomore year, and it is ultimately what kind of turned my faith around. Uh, it was February, and I, uh, my grandpa was battling cancer for about four years. It uh, hit my family really hard, and I just remember being so ticked off at God. Like, why would you take, like, one of my favorite human beings ever away from me? And uh, I, I got really, really upset, and I was just like, you know, God, I tried to give you so much. I, I took the extra step, and you just, you know, snatched him away, and it hurt me really bad, and I was like, you had your chance, God, you know, whatever. I'm like, I can fulfill my desires here on earth. I have other things. So logically, I, uh, you know, just started, you know, I stopped going to Bible study for a bit. You know, I still go to Mass. That never stopped. But uh, I'm like, well, let's do the logical thing, and I'll start putting all my effort and time into sports, right, because that'll, that'll make me happy. So I started, you know, just putting the extra time in. I would just start running. I'd stay after practice, and I would just work, 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 and I'm like, I want to go get that state championship because that's going to fulfill this heart's desire. You know, that's what I came here for was to be, you know, a good athlete, and I, that's my goal. I want a state championship. I promised that to my grandpa, so I'm going to go get it for him. And, uh, yeah, we went. Ended up winning the state title. Huge blessing and so many memories. And I wouldn't trade him for the world. But probably two days after we won it, I was like, back to normal life. Like, why do I not feel satisfied anymore? I'm like, this is what I worked for, like this is what I wanted, this is what I grew up dreaming of, and it's done, right? Like, cool, it's the next thing. And I'm like, so logically I go, all right, well basketball started, let's go win a basketball one, right? Like, let's do it. And uh, it just got to the point, kind of, when I was like, hey, I, uh, I can't do this anymore. I'm just living a life that's so shallow, and uh, this isn't gonna fulfill me by any means. So I finally just started going back to Bible study, and I started going to adoration, and I was like, God, I, I can't do this anymore. I just, just, there's something more to life than what I'm living right now. And it, I had to start letting these wounds go. I was so broken from, like I said, my grandpa that hurt me so bad that I'm like, I think we should talk about it. You know, I know that everything isn't always easy. And uh, let's dive into this wound. And uh, yeah, it helped me big time to really start opening up to God and saying, hey, I... Uh, I really want to come to know you because the joy that I felt before all this happened is something that I haven't even come close to having. So I really just started taking it more serious and I started hanging out with the right people. I got involved in a small group and I was like, God, I, I, there's something more. These people that I see walking the hallways, they just have this genuine smile like they know Christ. Whenever I walk into adoration, I just see people with these smiles on their face and that's like, I want that. That is what I want. I feel like I was made for that. And it really just made, got me out of my comfort zone. And I was like, you know what, Lord, I just, I can't live this way anymore. And I want to give back to other people. And I want to spread this joy that other people are giving me. So I really started taking my faith a lot more serious. And that allowed me to kind of take off. And I started leading Bible study groups, and I was starting to be the one that was putting in the time. I was praying on my own, which I hadn't done before. I started opening the Bible at my house, which was huge. And it was just, things started to come together, and I realized a relationship with God has got to be on top of everything because you can't put your stuff into things that are going to end when you have something that's eternal. God is outside of time. Everything here comes to an end. When I won my state championship, those are over. Those are great memories, but it's in the past, right? It's a, it's a goal you achieve, and then it's done. It's over. God is something that is outside of time to the point that even when my time is done here on earth, 
he's still going to be there. And the more I give over my life to him, you know, he's going to be the one standing by me on Judgment Day, and he's going to be, he's going to be my lawyer helping get me into heaven. And uh, I want him on my team. Um, I think the one quote that really stuck out to me through this whole thing when I was praying about this was uh, Saint Jose Maria Escriva, and it was uh, the struggle is a sign of holiness. I figured when I started. I'm really taking my faith serious and following everything would be easy and those smiles people had on their faces would be forever. And when I read, I remember reading this quote a few years ago and that, I mean, that hit me deep when it's like the struggle that shows that you are striving for holiness. And then the next part is a saint is a sinner who keeps on trying. Each and every one of us are sinners, guys, and I will right up there with the rest of you. Every one of us here isn't perfect. We've all had our flaws. And we're up here just saying that we just keep on trying, we keep on pushing forward, and uh, that's what led us, you know, to where we are today. And I guess back to the whole struggling idea. God never said this journey was going to be easy for any of us, and I think that is a very important thing to take away from this. Is actually He did it in Luke nine. Verse twenty three, he tells us to pick up our cross and follow me. He said, They mocked me first. They're going to come after you, and it's just going to be worth it. And I think that's one thing we have to take some faith in is knowing that uh, if you do take up your cross and follow him, that he's going to reward you so, so, so much. Um, yeah, so I guess my big thing that I want you guys to take away is if you just let God really fulfill your desires and open up. None of us up here are perfect, and I think God works in each, of us, each and every one of us in separate ways. And I think the beauty is, I know I've talked to some guys before, we just think of these saints as people who are so incredible and amazing, and they were, and we see their statues, and they're six foot three, and they're bulky. And I read from Father Chris L.R., he had a podcast the other day, and he comes out, and he's like, Moses, one of the best prophets we know, he's the one who literally brought us the Ten Commandments. And I bet you guys didn't know, Moses was four foot eight, and he had a speech impediment. He literally takes people, he takes the lowest of the low, and he brings them up, and he makes it, because nobody would expect it. Why would a, a guy who's four foot eight and has a speech impediment, can hardly talk and be understood, why would God make something so great out of him when it seems like he doesn't really have anything? God wants to use each and every one of us in a different way, and when you die to yourself and you really open up and say, God, I, I want to live this life for you because I know there's more to this life than myself. Just let him take over your heart, and I think that it'll you'll never be more amazed by what he can do. And I just think as we're getting ready for adoration here that we just, I want you to open up your hearts, guys. All it takes is one opportunity. Open it up and say, you know, God, come into my heart. I'm so broken. Come into my wound, and guys, it's not easy, but I'm telling you, it's going to be so worth it. it just You just got to give God a sliver, and he's going to take it and open it a mile and say, let's get this fixed, because I love you so, so much. So please take that step for me tonight. Open up to Christ as he's walking by you, literally the king of the universe, the king of kings, our savior, and even just our dad is going to be right in front of you, just waiting for you to welcome him in. And he wants to fulfill even the smallest piece of your heart. Just let him in and he will just overflow you. So I guess on an ending note here, all of us that came to talk to you tonight, we all were in your shoes at one time. We're up here telling you about our journey because... We want you guys to learn from us and to know that we all started exactly where you guys are. And if you just learn to really give yourself over, that it's just going to, it's your life's going to be so much better, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Each and every one of us has our own story. Your story is different than mine, different than all these other speakers. But that's the beauty of it is God made each and every one of you different. And each and every one of our stories is going to end different. And that's the beauty of it. So really just open up yourselves tonight to Christ. I thank you guys for coming and listening to all of us, and hopefully you can take something away, and uh, God bless.